Hey, welcome everyone. It is Hollywood on the Rocks on a Wednesday. My name is Chris Gore. Alan Ng is in Austin, Texas for the South by Southwest Film Festival. We'll be telling you a lot more about that on our Friday show. But today, the fourth chapter in the D-Files series of articles has dropped on filmthreat.com. We're going to be talking about that. Alan is trying to adjust mic le levels here on the music. He's doing a terrible job, but let's get going. There's too much to discuss today. I'm happy you're here because it's going to be a big show. Big, big show. We're going to be talking about Oscars and DEI. We're going to be talking with the director of a horror film that opens on Friday, Imaginary. The director of Imaginary will be here talking with us at the end of the show. Lots to talk about. Your comments, questions, concerns. Let's go. Let's start the show. Where is uh, where is Mr. Ng here? Where is he? Where? Okay. So Alan somehow disappeared. He was there. I have no idea where. It Alan, we're doing this. We're doing it right now, Alan. I'm going to tickle you with my lightsaber. Ah. That was not what I meant to uh, know. Alan! 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 Al! Alan! Ah. Hey, man. <laughs> You're finally oh. here. Oh, well, I fi I'm finally here. Uh, yes. Yeah, I was. I've been on the road since this morning, and uh, I finally made it from from Dallas to Austin, and cool. here I am. Awesome. So you got to crash yeah. at the hotel in Dallas. Yeah, and I went to a Bucky's. That was pretty awesome. Oh uh, no, I saw the pictures. Yeah, it's like a Walmart, but with a hundred gas stations in front of it, or a <laughs> gas pumps in front of it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's great. Um, so much to talk about. We're going to get right to it. I want to see your comments and questions. We'll go through a few here before we launch things. Here we go. Hey, Blav says, awesome. Love the interviews. Yeah, the director of Imaginary, new movie from Blumhouse, opens Friday. Director talking to us. That's right, on Film Threat. An exclusive. The the show. <laughs> yep, JTPRX says, yes, Alan's Big D filing again. Thank you, JTPRX, for being a member. Jimmy Francis says, picked up the Blu-ray of Sound of Freedom that just came out here in Scandinavia, and out of three sales quotes on it, one is from Film Threat. What? what? Film Threat being seen as a seal of approval worldwide. We have I, Film Threat. <laughs> I don't remember approving a quote for it, but we'll take well, it. Well, approve a quote. I mean, look, we don't, I mean, look, if the quote is in the review and they're quoting the review, I mean, they don't yeah. technically need our permission. Um, it's nice when they ask. They don't always ask. They just quote the review. Yeah. And you, Film Thread has appeared on posters, billboards, um, trailers, DVD sleeves, trailers, movie trailers, a lot of stuff. Thank you, Jimmy Francis. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, okay, we gotta look it up. And Lord Thoth says, "Hey, like, share, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, sign up as a member, then join us on Discord." Let me tell you why being a member is a good thing. Because Bush and Ryu Cat also became a YouTube member. Here's why being a member is a good thing. This Friday, we're going to launch the RSVPs for the Film Threat VIP A-list party at CinemaCon, which is April Tuesday, April 9th. We're having a party at the Millennium Fandom Bar. The RSVP list will first go to members. And then, so, so we're going to just allow our members to RSVP first. Then we will publicly release the link and pretty much it's going to it's going to fill up really quick cuz i believe we only have 150 slots so there you go thank you bush and ryu cat for being a member yep. and thank so you if you're going to the other meetup show up a day early to our meetup show up a day early and it's sort of a cinemacon film threat party and mm -hmm. i have a huge announcement that i'm making on that day that is going to blow people's minds and also i think i'm giving away like blu-rays and a lot of free stuff and it's not, there's no cost to go. I mean, look, I hope when you go to the millennium fandom bar on April 9th, you, um, you know, buy a drink, 
buy some food, spend some money at the bar. That's how they make money, whatever. But it's the event itself is free, but we do have to limit the list. So there you go. Uh, yeah. Uh, Red French Moon says, I saw you on Normal World. That was fun. Quarter Black was <laughs> happy with his bucket. Oh, yeah. That's right. He, he was holding that bucket the entire time. Well, I owe Alan a bucket because yeah, I was I was originally going to go and then I couldn't. And then I said, well, Alan, just take your bucket. I'll give you a bucket next time I see you. So there you are. Yeah, I'm holding you to that. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. A couple quick comments before, before we launch in. Laura Buckle says, it's like Chris is looking up at Alan and Alan is looking down at Chris. Little unsettling. Got to say. Wait, because I'm because I. My eye line should be up here. I know. Mine's, I have to actually look down. I have to look at the screen, and you're looking down at your computer. You could put your computer on like a box or something. Well, I'm, doing the, I'm something. having problems with the computer, so I'm using the iPad. And, uh, you know, the camera on the iPad is like right on the edge of the screen. It, it doesn't look terrible. It doesn't look yeah. terrible. Well, I have to remember not to look at you, but look at this the, the side of it's my iPad. It's all good. IPad. Whatever. Yeah. One Punch Man Tolkien fan says this is the same angle that Alan broke his chair <laughs> on. That is right. right. It is right. That's right. And then uh, David Kelly for 499 pounds says, with all the Hollywood remakes and reboots going on, I think it's time they remake Brokeback Mountain with Margot Robbie and Sydney Sweeney. Oh, I would watch that's that. A, yeah, I'm all totally in on that. I, You know what? Let's let's start a kickstart. They should gender swap Brokeback Mountain. Oh, yeah. With Sydney Sweeney and Margot Robbie, David Kelly, thank you for that. That is yeah, a and I don't care if they portray themselves as the greatest cowboys in the world. Look, cowgirl. I I'm no, no, trying I... to I'm trying to not make a reverse cowgirl joke, and I don't know how to do it. <laughs> no, but I want to see him uh, you know, riding around the the stampede there, the uh the herd and uh, doing manly things and then uh not quitting each other. Well, look, this is another quick reminder to join us for the Oscar watch party that is this Sunday, March 10th, 3 p.m. Pacific time, 5 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Eastern. Join us for it. The um, We just released a promo video. Would you like to see the promo video? Absolutely. Do to it. To promote the event. And I'll give you a little tease of some of what we have been preparing for this for months. We've got like so many videos Fun. We're going to have guests as from Heel versus Babyface. Gary from Nerdrotic will be there. Kira Lynn from Hollywood First Look. Dante James from Verbal Riot Show. Alan and I will, of course, be there. I'll be wearing a tuxedo, but um, I'm super <laughs> excited. It's this Sunday. Alan has his tuxedo, right? Alan? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I brought that with me to Texas. Yeah. So check it out. Now, the reason we're starting so early is because the Oscars are starting early. So, so it's, I mean, there's really no way to get around it. The Oscars moved up their event an hour and they're only doing a half hour pre-show on the red carpet. So we will start at three o'clock as you know, we all kind of pile in. Everyone gets their TV set. Alan will have a TV in the background mm -hmm. playing it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it'll be, yeah, I've got it worked out with my kid, so she'll have you it got it worked out. Oh, that's right. That'll be, okay, well, we'll see if that works because we might have 10 people. Oh, yeah, then you're going to have to drop that. Well, but we'll do it anyways. Either All right, way, here's yeah. just a little tease of some of the stuff we've been working on for the show. Check this out. We like are trailblazers. That. We're trailblazers. Well, the, the annual film threat Oscar watch party has kind of turned into a thing, which is great. Oh, my God. Rich has become a YouTube member. And Benjamin. Thank you, Rich. Hey, now. Benjamin comes in $49.99. Random. But just saw Zack Snyder on Joe Rogan Experience. And he, ju he just said his dream job would be directing the Fountainhead 
for Netflix. He also acknowledges Ayn Rand is controversial, but also thinks like me that it's some that it, it would make an epic movie. That would make an epic movie. Yeah, I know I they've know. made. I know they've made it into a movie. It's just no one's watched it. They they've suppressed well, it's a little it. dated uh, now. But wow, Benjamin, thank you for your very generous super chat. Mm -hmm. And I do plan to watch that episode of Joe Rogan Experience. Um, I've never seen a real deep dive interview with that with Zack Snyder, um, so I'd love to see it. I did interview him once. Uh, maybe once or twice, actually, when I was at G4 TV and they would send me to film junkets. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, look, I'm, I'm really curious for that interview. Yeah. And part two of Rebel Moon is coming out soon, right? Yeah. That's yeah. happening. Well, in, in terms know. of Fountainhead, uh, you know, I think his best work is when he's adapting other people's work. Actually, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Uh, another quick comment here before we launch right in. Joseph's Dots for 499 Chains should arrive just in time for the Oscars stream. <laughs> well, thank you, Joseph. I will check my mail for those. And thank you so much. Uh, hopefully, hopefully I'll get them in time. But thank you. That's awesome. Very generous of you. All right. Let's get to, we have so many topics. Um, we already talked about normal world. So I want to talk about a sponsor that we have for the show. We're going to talk more about this on Versus. Um, but we actually have a sponsor for the show. It is the website criticless.com. What is criticless.com? It's kind of like the best way to describe it is it's like a social network for movie critics. It's where you can express your opinion and you can say, hey, uh, you know, uh, here's what I think about this movie. Here's what I think. It's it's literally like a social network just for people to talk about movies. Go to Criticlist.com. Alan and I both have accounts mm -hmm. there. You can follow me. I'm that Chris Gore. What are you on Criticlist? Alan? I'm my pal Al. My pal Al. I am that Chris Gore. Follow me. I'll follow you back. Um, it's all sorts of channels. It's It's specifically dedicated to film fandoms. And so I encourage, in fact, a lot of the writers from Film Threat are on Criticlist posting their reviews and their takes. So check it out. Go to Criticlist.com. We will put the link in the description of this episode. And we thank them as a sponsor of the show. Uh, it's great. We'll be talking about Criticlist a lot as we get some other people on there. and we'll, we'll be checking that stuff out. Okay. All right. Next thing we have to show. It's happened. Animation Vault Episode 2 has premiered. And we're going to watch it right now. This is the show uh, by Dom Dominic Pulsino. is an animator. He's worked on everything from The Simpsons, King of the Hill, um, Family Guy, uh, uh, Crapopolis. He's, he's worked on it. He's got a long list of credits. He is a fan of The Fellowship, FNT, also a fan of myself and Alan. Dominic might even be watching right now, but he released a second episode of his, his series of animations. Uh, I'm going to put, I'm going to put on my headphones right here and watch it. It's a minute and 38 seconds and it features, there is an Easter egg at the end. There's an Easter egg at the end. Pay very close attention. This Easter egg at the end, you will only get it. If you're a frequent watcher of film threat, Alan, have you seen this yet? <laughs> I uh, I heard it in the car. I didn't watch well, it. Well, you did not see it. So okay. I did not see it. The Easter egg comes at the very end. I may have to still frame it, but let's let's check it out. We're gonna watch this together as we launch in. Okay, here we go. Ready? All right. I'm just, Alan, can you mute me? Uh no, I can't. No, I can't. I'll do it myself. <laughs> yeah. I'll do it myself. Okay. All right. Let's watch. It's called One Day in Minor Earth. Whatever that okay. You're going to understand what that means in just a second. Okay. Just do it. Show it yeah, okay, here. We Fan Lord of the Rings for me is my top fantasy series of all time. Uh, but he captured the heart. Exactly what Rings of Recycled Fantasy didn't do. There is no heart there. By injecting, say, identity politics into a story, and it doesn't work. I'm really tired of all the sexism everywhere. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy ride. 
it's the little moments that make this film. It's the character moments. It's not these big battles. It's like when when Gandalf's telling Pippin. I, I, that scene is my favorite from Return of the King. He's telling him like, no, it's just another journey. That hope that used to be the good guy always wins. There's something to save. There's something you should strive for and like achieve something and be satisfied. And now it's just all dark and gritty and you're all doomed and everything's destruction. You want to watch that? You can just walk out your house. The the orcs are at the doors of the keep them and like Theoden just gives this incredible speech. Just oh. short and he's just like, fourth air lingers and out they go just. Mine is when Treebeard sends out a call and leads the last march of the ants to Isengard. Chills every time. It's a good scene. Kind of, this is like bittersweet, but just like when Lord of the Rings came out and I saw it, I was like, holy shit, the power of movies. We're in such a good position. This is going to get great. Like, more time goes on, the better it'll get, right? Uh, we kind of peaked, didn't we? <laughs> I guess <it's> kinda... <laughs> you got to unmute, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, for a sec, did you did you catch the little did you catch it? Well, I mean I caught I caught me. Is that what you're talking about? No, 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 no. No, you got I gotta back I up Dante. just slightly. Yeah. All right. What's oh. going on there? <laughs> it's an IKEA Is that chair. IKEA chair? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and it's it, you know what you know what I love about this? It's the second episode that you've been in and you yep. still don't talk. Well, Paul's in there too. Same same thing. <laughs> Paul's in there, Mauler. Who else? Yeah, uh, baggage claim I saw. Uh, comics division, baggage yeah, comics claim. Division. Oh my God, I got to send this out to them. I don't even think they know that they're in it. That's awesome. I know, this is great. All right, well. There's uh, one more, so, right? Yeah, there's a link in the description. Please watch that episode, like it, and subscribe to the channel, Animation Vault. Dominic knocking it out of the park with these episodes. There is an episode three that's coming shortly. There is an episode three coming shortly, so that Sweet. should be really cool. All right. Uh, we have so much Oscar news. We're going to get to the Oscar news momentarily. But Alan is here. Well, he I, I mean, he's here. <laughs> but Alan is here with the next chapter in the D-Files. <laughs> Alan, the D files right. is blowing up. the The uh, chapter four of the D files has has emerged. It's and it's let's let's get it right. It's the D files. So let's do that. Yes, part four. Part four. Slow death in a strange world. I'm going to bring it up on screen. Yes, please do. But um, t so tell us a little j without reading it right now. Tell us a little bit about what you go over in this chapter. Yeah. Well. Per your advice, we decided to split this one up because this yeah. one was getting really long. Um, but we covered basically everything that happened between Ryan the Last Dragon and Strange World, just leading up to Wish. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of these things where you, you know, you watch what Disney has been doing and you say to yourself, hey, I think they're doing these things or they're inserting these things in a subtle way. And we're here to show you that uh, it was far from subtle. And in fact, it was all intentional. And that um, everything that had happened up until that point was, was, you know, it, it, the, the agenda was there all along and it was openly talked about. And that's kind of what this current edition of Defiles is. Um, for example, in Ryan the Last Dragon, they completely radically uh, shifted the original story. And, uh, and in there, they, uh, they were intentional about d diminishing men. Um, you know, I, I can... Let's see. Let, let's let's just put it this way. Uh, in the article, we we I talk about how you know when discussions of story, uh, the the role of a man would would be brought up, and it was quickly pushed aside and said, "No, we can't we can't allow Raya and uh, I forget the other girl's name. Uh, I we can't allow men to assist them or help them or provide them comfort. You know, they need to find uh, their own strength from within or from with within the women other women in the group." And um, and any time discussions of that were brought up in story meetings, it was shut down. Uh, that's what I wrote. Uh, I can tell you that part of the story is much worse. Um, mm. And it, you know, and um, and of course, I can't say a thing about it. But um, that's essentially what was happening. Uh, well, and I mean, then, yeah, you and I both saw Strange World in a theater. Mm -hmm. It opened Thanksgiving weekend. No, no actually, I was talking Raya. Uh, Strange World. Right, right, right. We Strange World. 
okay, just to just to pivot to Strange yeah. World, you and I both saw it in a theater Thanksgiving weekend. I remember this specifically mm -hmm. because I remember texting you and going like, I'm alone in a theater and there's like four or five other people. There was yeah. a family and like one other dude. And then I'm by myself sitting here. I'm going, this is a Disney movie opening on Thanksgiving weekend. Why am I in a near nearly empty theater i mean it was like there were like six yeah. seven people in the well, mine was worse. On. mine was worse i was i was sitting there by myself and then a grandfather and grandson sat right behind me and the and the grandson talked the entire time and i will tell you thank god he was talking the entire time <laughs> or i would have gone you ever see a movie like that where you're like i mean look i have a pretty pretty strict policy of like i hate when people talk during yeah. movies except when it's a terrible movie <laughs> i don't mind yeah. God, uh, it, it actually can kind of add to it yeah. or like a horror film where people scream. But yeah. But, so here, um, yeah. So let, let's back up to Ryan just for a second. Please. Um, it cost 120 million, 120 to 150 million. Um, it, okay. So it didn't do well. Uh, I think critically it got like a 93% on Rotten Tomatoes. But I think after looking back at it and thinking it through, um, uh, people are starting to turn a little bit on Raya. And um, the movie, it didn't do that well and you know i i think disney would chalk that up to COVID because this was the first movie back in COVID. i remember wearing a mask seeing the movie and also it was part of the premium access plus that disney was doing so you mm -hmm. could you could watch raya on disney plus for an additional 30 dollars uh and and so That's right yeah and so if you look at the numbers uh the first movie did, that disney did that with was um was mulan and the result of Disney Access Plus was a um, Mulan, uh, Mandalorian, and uh, I forgot the other one. There was another series uh, that uh, that Disney Plus had. They when those went out, uh, they saw a rise in subscribers. When Ryan Last Dragon came out, there was no additional subscribers, new subscribers, and it earned on the thirty dollar premium to watch it at home. It earned thirty percent less than than Mulan. Really. Uh, Mm. yeah and so this movie uh it, it lost money <laughs> and oh, then i'm not surprised so anyways oh, sorry yeah go ahead. and then i'll just go the next movie that disney put out in canto it cost 120 million to 150 million uh and that did wildly well uh and and i'll tell you why it did well because when john lasser was fired uh Encanto was already halfway through the production so the story was already locked lin-manuel miranda already had his songs um, and most people say that Encanto, the reason Encanto is so great is because of Lin-Manuel Miranda's songs and also a very uh, a dynamic group of characters. And you can kind of see John Lasseter's influence. And I think when he left, Disney just left that project alone and said, look, it's already in good hands. The train is already rolling. And uh, and they brought it to completion. And, and that was a legit hit for Disney, which then brings us to Strange World. And with Strange World, uh, you know, this is the first movie where Jennifer Lee has her full fingerprints and hand hand in the story and the animation of this. And um, and if you remember Strange World, which no one does because they didn't watch it. Right. Uh, yeah. The Strange World is basically an allegory, uh, an environmental allegory about the dangers of fossil fuels. Uh, if you were I mean, you saw the movie, you know, you know, yeah, I know I'm right yeah. about that. But the other yeah. thing was uh, it was also the first occasion of a, an openly gay character uh, in the movie doing openly gay things, meaning uh, he had a crush on a boy and uh, a lot of the movie was about him trying to muster the courage to ask him out or to to be his partner. Um, and that's, you know, it was that, that idea of, hey, let's not entertain kids anymore. Let's uh, force a message upon them. And right. so, so from a production standpoint, um, I told you, uh, uh, Encanto and Raya cost about 120, 150 million. Uh, Strange World rose to 180 million. Mm. Uh, and then also, uh, opening weekend earned, I believe, 12 million. And uh, and in the end, uh, Variety reported that Strange World lost 100 million dollars uh, total. Also, uh, internationally, uh, half of the countries didn't want Strange World because of the openly gay theme, and so it. So this is the first time you'll see that the international box office was significantly significantly lower uh, than the domestic for a Disney project. Uh, it was it is, uh, international was like half half the amount of domestic. Is this one of those cases where 
I mean, you talk about it in the article, but I'm just ask. I've read the article, obviously, mm -hmm. and we'll put a link in the description of this, uh, the clip in the episode, of course. But um, is this one of those cases where they didn't even open the movie in other countries or did they radically change it? Someone even told me, well, you know, not, I mean, you can't you can't get rid of the, the gay theme. Because it's so ingrained in the movie, it 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 it's at yeah. least. I mean, if you're just talking dialogue, you've got to think it's at least five to ten minutes of dialogue, and it's intercut within the main the main story. And so it's not like you, and it's not like they held back. It's just the countries wouldn't allow it to be shown in their country. That, that's what my that's what my question is. Yeah. So it's like, what countries were some of the countries? Someone just sent well, me well, China for one. <laughs> Right, China, uh, Saudi Arabia, but in fact, yeah. someone someone sent me the coolest weird tip about uh, Microsoft products. If you don't, mm -hmm. if you want to sort of excise the wokeness, is you change the region to Saudi Arabia, but then you change the language to English, and no. all <laughs> those that stuff goes away. I know it's a weird pro tip. I just got an email well, about that. Yeah. I, I want to try that. That sounds really interesting. I, I mean, it's hypocritical for one thing. I mean, honestly, right. if, if you're going to virtue signal and say that we're going to stand behind this, you know, you know, I, that's what was happening here is Jennifer Lee and crew. They stood behind these decisions. Uh, you know, it, it says something about you. If, if when you go international that you won't stand behind that decision for, for, right. for money, for purely money's sake. Uh, it, it just shows you that, uh, that, you know, they, I don't know. It, it's, it's sort of evil that they want to do it here just in America and, and then kowtow outside of America, you know? Well, there's a, there's a book that is coming out or it may already be out by Logan Lansing uh, with James Lindsay called the queering of the American mind. Oh, a new school religious cult poisons the minds and bodies of normal kids. Um, I mean, straight up a lot of what I saw in strange mm -hmm. world was propaganda, not just, I mean, the character being gay, whatever there've been yeah. gay characters in movies and, and, and whatnot, and even cartoons, whatever you think like forever, that's not, the, there's so many other agendas that are in strange world. It was, it was literally like the let's throw in all the agendas and the kitchen sink. So it just becomes so solely fo like it. It's like, entertainment was secondary mm -hmm. to all of the to just all the multiple agendas yeah multiple agendas that are yeah. just woven into one movie it's like they just threw it all in one and then and then wish is sort of like i know you're not at when it comes to the d files you're not at wish yet you will be getting there yeah but it's um that's just everything anyways i bring up that book because i see that it's getting a lot mm -hmm. of uh, traction online and it kind of look i mean yeah i mean you, you and i both have gay friends uh, i have very a lot of them friends. actually yeah you know? and and you know it's it's not that you know what's wrong is having gay people in your movie it's the fact that they're you they have to go out of their ways way to prove that these characters are gay uh and, and they would do things that that i've never seen my friends do for example um, my friends, when I hang out with them, they're not constantly making out. <laughs> you know, it's not like they need to sh prove that they're gay to me by kissing for some reason. And that's what you, they do here. You know, it, it's, it's almost to the point of recruitment as opposed to creating a truly dynamic, uh, truly thought out gay character. And, and, and honestly, I don't, I don't even want straight characters to uh, show off their sexuality in everything I see. No, it's just that when the when the first thing about that character is their gayness, it's like that's not that's an aspect of a person, mm -hmm. but that's not the whole. Per that's not what the person is, and it, that just yeah. annoys me. It's like especially when Disney does this stuff, they lean into stereotypes yeah. <laughs> and they lean into pushing stuff instead of just have that person be a person first. Yeah, you know, it, so it's like. like it, it, yeah, no, I was gonna say in Strange World, it's the character's name is Ethan, and and it's not like they're saying, well, Ethan, he's a he's a brave soul who uh, who's an awkward teen who loves his father and wants to know his grandfather. And hey, by the way, let me go and kiss this guy. You know, that's that's essentially what they're trying to do. Yeah, you know, it, it, that um, it's that aspect of his life that that you have to show off in a way that's unnatural uh, to the story, or or just brought in to the story uh, for for no reason other than to exclaim that this that's a part of who he is well uh 
congratulations again, Alan. Yeah. On chapter yeah. four. Let, let me let, let me tease right. let me tease the next one because uh, there was a narrative I've been putting out there about Wish uh, that I've been putting out there for a very long time as to why it was bad, and uh, this <laughs> literally yesterday uh, several sources confirmed to me that I was completely wrong, and that what I thought was wrong about it uh, it's actually worse. So uh, that'll be in the next key files. What? When you say worse, you got to give me an example. Oh, well, let's just say that, uh, you know, I personally had chalked up the low quality of Wish to the fact that the project was rushed, uh, that it took uh, six to seven months uh, to, to be animated. Uh, while that was true, that wasn't the reason why Wish is the worst animated film of the entire Walt Disney 100 year legacy. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, yep. Yep. I can't wait. Stay I tuned. Cannot... Stay tuned. All right. All right. Okay. Let's go to your comments and questions here. We'll start with some super chats here from Jason Webster for five says, Chris, I have a feeling the Oscar watch party will be really memorable one for the ages and uh, not not when like you, the first one <laughs> when you see when you see some of the video all i can say is this when you see some of the videos that are being prepped for this it's going to be nuts it's going to be a full house we're going to watch the oscars together and we're going to be goofing on all of it i'm just but saying nothing's going to beat that first oscar watch party well <laughs> The one where, where, yes, the slap. Red French Moon, who's a member, says, I don't even care about the Oscars anymore. I'll just be there. I'll be just there for the watch party, though I'll be tired at work the next day. Ah, just have fun. We're going to have fun. And MK Solid 82 says, Chris, I thought the normal world set was going to catch fire with Asian, with Alan's <laughs> Asian heat. Oh, my gosh. I that is a pretty cool Asian studio. Alan. What can I say? Yeah, I like Alan, being there. That's a cool studio. Oh, the studio's cool. So, did you get the tour? Uh, kind of. Uh, you got the all in the fa all in the family set set visit. Oh, just just like a bunch of stuff. Did yeah. you go to uh, Alex Stein's set? He's right next. No, door. but uh, as I was leaving, I ran into Alex Stein. Did you say he, hi to him? Chatted. Yeah, and uh, he he was supposed to send you a picture of of me and him to you. I will look forward to that all picture. Right. Cool. Alan Con Ning says D subversion. There you go. Yeah. Not sure that's how it's pronounced. Thing. But, yeah. Hey, Pilgrim Media is here for two. I'm following Gamergate Part Two. It's raging. <laughs> yeah, we haven't weighed in on that. Um, I mean, I've been on other shows where I've brought where I've talked about it. Um, it's something. Are you talking about Sweet I, Baby Ink? Yeah, Sweet Baby Ink. Okay. We need to do a whole thing about that. But that is, um, I think that other people have have done a really good job. So I'm gonna let them continue. I may I've weighed in you know, when I've been on other shows mm -hmm. that are part of my regular weekly regimen, but um, yeah, it is. Um, they've been exposed yeah, and they've been exposed and, and I'm going to be more, I freaking pre-ordered <laughs> suicide squad kills the justice league based on a trailer. I saw like six months ago. I'm like, that looks cool. Pre-order forgot all about it. I haven't played a minute of it. And I feel like an idiot because the game is like eight. You can finish in like a day. Yeah. Well, sweet really baby short. ink. Sweet baby ink. Thanks you for your money. Yeah. <laughs> so dumb. But thank you, Pilgrim Media, and I'm following it too. Toxic Waltz N8. You have to click features. It's not currently on the front page. Yeah, we need to click the featured button off, which I can't do. Should I go in and edit it? I can't wanna... do it right now. Just okay. I, I think I could do it. Well. Just drop I'm, the link. I'm going to drop the link right now in the chat. How about that? Because yeah, I can do it. So I'm going to do it. Okay. I think I can. There's the link in the chat. Also, you could just search D files. We need, yeah. look, we, we post so much content on a daily basis. There's at least five new stories a day. A lot of crap advertising. I, I want to almost apologize when people go to the website because we have so many ads, but we wouldn't be able to survive without it. Yeah. So there are browsers you can use to kind of, you know, not see the advertising. What is it? Brave is a browser you can use. So, but thank you, Toxic Waltz N8, for pointing that out. Uh, Jason Webster, Alan's D files is more attention grabbing than any 
film Disney has released in the last few years. Great coverage in the D files articles, Alan. Thank you. No. And Chris Holmes says the merchandise for these films are all on clearance sale across multiple <laughs> retailers. Great success. Well, it's about to end up in a, um, in a landfill. Yeah. Uh, Slim I mean, I have to keep, uh, sorry. I just have to keep reminding everyone that wish came out barely three months ago. Yeah. Barely three months ago. And it is like, wow. Uh, Slim Jim four nine one member for three months says, thanks film threat for the D files and exposing Disney. Some super chats here from Benjamin for nine, nine, nine. Alan and Chris should drop something before their Oscar stream in honor of Matt and Trey. Drop something. You mean like wear dresses? Drop something. We could drop a deuce. Well, Alan, journalist. <laughs> yeah. There you true. go. Benjamin, thank you for that. It's very generous. Okay, uh, D-Files is on the front page now. Piano Man 1995 has become a YouTube member. Thank you for that. Alan, just put, just go to filmthreat.com right on the front page. Yeah, and scroll thank down you. a little bit. Yeah. Thank you, Piano Man. Yeah, just scroll down. Red French Moon for five euros says, I'm curious you're having a feedback about the D files about exec at Disney. If they are looking into it or they keep ignoring the problem. We have not been contacted by Disney, no. um, not by anyone in any official capacity. And as far as I know, we're still on their press list, yeah. but I doubt so here, it. Here's the test. Uh, will they give me press credentials to D23 this year? Hmm. Yeah, you might not get them. Yeah. You might not get them. And by the way, Disney is particularly uh, vindictive when it comes to treating mm -hmm. press people that they're not happy with. I know, for example, John Campia has been banned from things. Has he? From yeah. Disney he, or? He's kind of lightweight when it comes to his criticism. He's, he's yeah. you know, he, he doesn't, he doesn't really go, he doesn't go hard into the paint, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So there you go. Yeah. But then again, what is Disney going to announce at D23 this year? Yeah. What are <laughs> they going to announce? What are they going to announce? I have no yeah. idea. Apparently um, half of that stuff is get, just got canceled. So, uh, Going through these other comments here. The Avengers Rising, Turkey, Vietnam, China, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Nigeria, and Ghani banned the movie because of the gay character indeed and jtp rx says looks like mickey uh are, are had too many skittles that happens hey willie the monkey king's music who's a member says legit question to mr gore and mr ing how much of strange world's pivot to more adult fare has to do with disney's audience being shifted from kids to childless adults oh hmm. that's interesting um there are what they call Disney adults. Disney adults are the adults um, who are super into Disney. They go to Disneyland. They have Disney passes. They probably have pets, but they don't have, they don't have actual children. And they're just, their whole lives revolve around going to Disney and seeing Disney movies and everything. Disney. Um, that's a very interesting theory yeah. and maybe straight, but it just, it just goes to prove that if, that audience was interested in strange world. They would have gone to see strange world. Alan, what are, what are your thoughts? Well, I can tell you that uh, wish was that in, in the sense of that movie is so full of Disney Easter eggs that, you know, much of it was meant for the Disney audience, the Disney childless adult audience. And uh, fortunately they didn't show up either. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think Disney is in this position anymore uh, to where they even care about who their audience is. They just want to tell their stories. And and I will tell you that this is going to be uh, the major part of the next D-Files. Uh, just the fact that they, they've kind of gone off track. And, and they think, I think they think in their minds they know what people want, uh, when in reality people don't want it. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I, that's, that's, I, I, yeah, I just don't think that I think that audience is a narrow yet very dedicated audience. Mm -hmm. And they certainly are a segment. But the majority of people that are Disney are families. And they're families who are par with parents with 
you know, who have kids that they want to pass along the experience of uh, and the magic of Disney to their children. It's something that I think used to happen with Star Wars, not so much anymore. I, I don't know that kids are into Star Wars as much as they used to be. So, yeah. Well, yeah. The, the Star Wars hasn't given, I mean, I keep thinking about it. I was 10 years old when Star Wars first came out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, watching the sequels, I can't imagine 10 year old me would be that excited about Star Wars seeing it. Right. Hey, and Vorpal Snack says, that's a rad tip, Chris. Hey, don't thank you. Uh, don't thank me. Thank the person who emailed me about an hour ago that I forgot. <laughs> but the, yeah, no. Uh, that is an interesting tip. I didn't even think about that, but Microsoft really pushes stuff. So that's a good way to get rid of it. Uh, Mike MC Wong. Hey, Mike, how's it going, man? Uh, says that Mickey Mouse throwing up rainbow puke is genius. Whoever drew that deserves a prize. <laughs> that would be our producer, Glenn Brown. Glenn, did you hear that? Glenn just makes us look good all the time. Absolutely. Bellox, who's a member, says, so true, I'm gay and hate the shoehorning of gay characters for pandering. It's cringe. I don't understand why a character cannot just be gay and just, like, be a person instead of it becomes an identity, right? Like, there is more to people in terms of, you know, what they believe in, what's important to them, how they treat others. Um, there's so much more, and when you devolve it down to, like, this is a black person. This is an Asian. This person's Latina. It's dumb. It's dumb. I want to know what the what this person stands for. All those other things are whatever. They're whatever. You know, interesting, but not but not the whole thing. It, it is. It is. It's just annoying. And there are so many actually. Disney likes it. They they like to or they like to brag now. Well, we we kind of invented all this. There have been gay characters throughout history of film. Um, have they been as prominent? No. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. Like, and there are a lot of characters that are sort of coded. I hate that term, coded gay. Like, I think C three PO. Although there is a thing that like C three PO or or a thing British yeah. or gay, you know, British accent. And then and then you've got like Doctor Smith. I think was a little effeminate. You know, he's kind of a coward. Um, always getting uh, Will Robinson in trouble. He might have been gay. But whatever. Who cares? Yeah, well, I remember, you know, you go to work, you, you do a project with somebody. Can you imagine if one of the people on your team was just constantly talking about his girlfriend the entire time? Uh, you know, you just want to get the job be done. annoying. Yeah, you want to get the job done. You don't want to have someone just constantly talking about their girlfriend and that has nothing to do with the project or the task at hand. And that's right. kind of what's happening here. These characters have, have a story they have to, to push. And if right. one character constantly talking about their girlfriend, uh, it, it again, gets annoying. Buford T justice for 49 99. Keep up the good work boys. Wow. Thank you, Buford. We appreciate that. Dang. We, we might have to like play a video to celebrate that. I'm going to get maybe, should I do another tease of what we're going to talk about at the watch party here? I'm going to do this like real quick. It's going to be weird. We have so many videos for the watch party. I hope we have time to watch them all. So you ready for this? Okay. Yeah. A, Sorry, little, here a little tease of things that we may play during the watch party at uh, for the Oscars. Do you have a bold imagination? Are you full of hope for the future? You like to play with trucks and superhero action figures and dream of making it in Hollywood someday? Maybe even working for Disney? Let me ask you then, are you a boy? A white boy? Then forget about it. Forget your dreams. We don't want your kind here and we don't want to hear from you. You've ruled Hollywood long enough. We're going in a different direction. You're not at all what we're looking for. Do you have a talentless, bossy sister? Brought to you by fairness and justice and equity and inclusion and diversity and accessibility for all. By our logo, you can see we make racism fun. That was put together by Gaslight Station. Go to gaslightstation.com. It's also a YouTube channel. 
uh, who produced a bunch of videos for for uh, the film threat watch party for the Oscars. That's just a tease of what you'll see. We're just going to be playing these videos randomly uh, during breaks in the show. And we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to laugh at the, uh, I'll tell you this. I think there'll be more laughs at the watch party than the actual Oscars. That's my prediction. Yeah, that, so that's go. the way it happens every year. Yeah. All right. We're going to wrap up on these comments here, but we have so many good ones and I appreciate it. Very thoughtful comments here and some very generous super chats. Benjamin for four nine nine says, I think most kids are into drugs now. Uh, that sucks. Um, and goes on for another 499 from Benjamin says some of these Disney adult babes are like the girls in drama class back in the day. They're big, but they're down. Um, yeah, kind of, mm. I don't know. I just, uh, I, what I don't like is that I feel like there is a sense of hopelessness amongst kids. And that's very sad for me to see. I've always been sort of an obnoxiously optimistic person, uh, but with a measured reality in there. Um, and, and what saddens me is seeing the rates of depression in kids. When I say kids, I mean, teenagers for the most part and how there's a sense of hopelessness, you know, college, you're not going to be able to afford it. You're not going to be able to afford a house, your, your future, the, whatever the American dream was, um, you know, it doesn't matter the earth, you know, all the climate change, it doesn't, not, nothing matters. Don't have kids, all the messaging that's going out to kids these days is damaging. And, and I think it, mm. I don't, I don't like to think that way. I think that we are so amazing as, as, as a civilization that we can solve these problems. You know, I think it's kind of almost arrogant of man to think that we could have such an impact on the planet that we could destroy it. Planet's <laughs> going to be fine with or without us. And I think that, we have come so far as a society, as a species, that there are problems that will come our way and we will solve them if the right leadership is there to guide the way. I truly, truly believe that. I am an eternal optimist. So um, the messaging yeah. to kids now is wrong. And I think that it... It is damaging ultimately. And, and I speak this, I say this as a father to two kids. Um, Alan, you're also a father mm -hmm. to it. Like, like I, you have an investment in the future of this planet. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I want to go down the right path. I don't want to be spinning my wheels on something that's not going to make a difference in the world. And, and also I hate the gaslighting that's going on in the subject. And, and, and you brought up, you brought up leadership. Um, we used to have leaders. We used to have people who inspired us. Uh, you know, I, I was just listening to Bob Iger's comments. Uh, you guys were talking about it on the on the Nooner. And the first thought that in my mind was, how is Bob Iger a leader? Uh, I, I don't see, uh, you know, he doesn't talk about vision. He talks about, um, he talks about things that he could do. He talks about plans that they might try to do. Uh, he seems to be speaking to what the current winds are saying. But he's yeah. not someone that you look forward to. You know, you, when you look uh, look at the next five years of Disney, what do you see? You see nothing. You don't see anything optimistic. You don't see anything positive. You don't see anything worth investing your money in at the moment. And that that's the fault of Iger, who can't who can't inspire people to want to invest in this company. It's just really sad. It's just really sad the state mm -hmm. of affairs where we are now and. Um, I think that as a parent, you have to kind of ignore it. You almost have mm -hmm. to just like, you have to be really, really one as a parent, you should always kind of filter the media that goes to kids yeah. in particular, but you have to be diligent now and, and really look at what are the core messages of movies and, and television shows mm -hmm. that you're exposing to your kids. Almost nothing modern is, is helpful. Yeah. Well, the more majority of parents have abdicated all that to to the schools, right? <laughs> to raise, to teach and raise their children. More comments here as we go. Sons and Shadows gifted five film threat memberships. Hey, for those of you that are members, you're going to get early access to RSVP for Vegas. Then I'm putting it out in the public. Then I'll put it out to everyone, and then we're going to promote on social media. And um, I'm going to guess it'll 
those those RSAPs will be gone pretty quickly. Uh, Benjamin says Trey Parker and Matt Stone dropping acid at the Oscars. Kind of what that graphic looks like. Um, the Avengers Rising says, "Hey Chris, will you and Alan watch Superman Unbound and give it a review online? Sometimes when you get the chance, please." Superman Unbound is that a um, animation? Yeah, what is that on HBO Max? Alan, you have a search button. Uh, I'm on my iPad, but I can. <laughs> I can okay. do this awkward. I can do this, this awkward. It's interesting. Tom Siebert, who's in the other room. What? No. He's not. Is he at work? Uh, Tom says Gay Perry, played by Val Kilmer and Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, is all time great gay character. Well, like even like freaking Blue Velvet, right? Has um. Uh, why am I spacing on his name? He played Dr. Yui in Dune. Um, oh, yeah, my brain today. Yeah, not doing great. This is what happens when I do like a bunch of streams in a row. Yeah, I did the Nooner. That's super intense. So, um, but yeah. yeah. By the way, Superman Unbound is the 2013 animated direct-to-video Superman film based on a Jeff Johns story, Superman Brainiac. Okay. Probably not going to be at the top of the list, going to be honest, because we're so focused on newer stuff. But um, I think we'll do, you know, in, in, in the amp up to James Gunn's Superman, we'll certainly be covering Superman related things. And thank you, Tom, for your comment. <laughs> thank you, Tom, for more than your comment. Tom's practically a sponsor of the show right now. Thank you, Tom. Jason Webster says for the Oscar Watch party. It would be great if you hold your own awards. The Oswalds, where the panel vote on each category and Chris announces the winners. Hmm. Um, well, hmm. We already we already <laughs> do an award show, anyways. Um, we already do an award show called Award This. So, uh, you know, uh, I mean, we'll we'll we're gonna stay focused on the oscars for this one i mean award this is our annual event where we champion independent films and we do an award show that's a lot of fun joel reese dean stockwell oh why did i uh. why did i forget his name he was also the boy with the green hair so there you go and then uh thank you joel reese and then benjamin for 499 says in another universe chris and alan are my gay dads oh are we I wonder, are we the gay dads? I don't know. Because it would be an interracial relationship, and I don't think that would go. Yeah. That would be that would be weird. <laughs> to yeah. be clear, I am a straight man. And I am too. And I'm super straight. But and I, I am also, engaged in a heterosexual relationship. Yeah, and we're both straight. We want to get that. Yes, I'm in a heterosexual relationship. I'm putting it out there. I'm all on board with breasts. That Alan and I are straight. I stand with them and in between them. <laughs> what was that about? Oh, because we were what? talking about <laughs> we were talking about wicked. <laughs> oh my god! Are, yeah, is that what we were talking about? Oh, that's yeah, crazy. We were talking about wicked. That's crazy. All right, we have the director of Imaginary joining us shortly. I just want to like uh, show you something that I found. Which I think you might find interesting. This was just sent to me. This was just sent to me during the show. Things happen, folks. Things happen during the show. Let me share this with you. Um, and I'm present, and then we're going to pivot. And we're going to talk about the Oscars. We're probably going to talk about the Oscars on um, on Friday also. But here it is. This is the cover from Scandinavia. Oh, Sound of Freedom, and it says Gripen den Ock. You're just you're so rude to freaking at the master. I just captured my words beautifully. <laughs> but we met oh. film threat made it on the cover of the I Scandinavian Blu ray disc. Oh. How's that for they, something? They, they pulled the best phrase from that review. You know what? I'll take it. I'll take <laughs> I it. But I, I think I got to brush up on my Scandinavian. I know. Yeah. I hope there's a bump in our Scandinavian uh, audience now. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I got a private message and there you go. Right. Um, another comment here says constitution pictures is film threat going to a movie in a new movie in Burbank tomorrow. 
What is there a movie meetup tomorrow? No, there isn't tomorrow. But there will be a week from tomorrow. We're all going to see the American Society of Magical. Alan, what's the rest of the movie uh, title? It, it would be uh, Negroes. That's it. That's the one. Yeah. So um, that movie is, uh, we're going to go see it. For some reason, oh, okay. I guess so. The, so there's no it. meetup tomorrow because, you know, um, Alan and I have actually already seen the movies that we're going to review on Friday. No meetup, but there will be. And I, I should be kind of private more about this because it's gotten so big now, I can't control it. So I don't know. Just go to the AMC Burbank 16. I'm usually there on Thursdays, nine out of 10 times. But I, I think I need to come up with a different way to do the meetup because I can't, I can't manage doing a weekly meetup. It's not, um, it's not for me. So there you go. Uh, but thank you. Constitution pictures. Yeah. But there was a time where there were good movies in theaters every week. And, uh, and, and, and you being there was there by default, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, sir. Switch crookington. Why does everyone in the space say F the wokeness, but scared to say Negro. Oh, I just said it. <laughs> I'm not scared to say it. I'm kind of, I'm doing a bit. I'm making it a goof because I paused. Let me explain jokes. See, I went to say yes. the title of the movie and then I paused. So Alan would have completed my statement and then I would have laughed at Alan and we'd all be having a good time. But people take what we say way too effing seriously when you and I are just having a good time. So there you go. That's all I want to say about that. Anyways, thank you, Sir Switch Crookington. We're not afraid to say it's just whatever. So, okay, let's talk about this. Um, and we'll do our predictions on Friday. Can we add that to the schedule? We'll do Oscar predictions. But I want to talk about this article before uh, imaginary director jo Jeff Wadlow, w Wadlow, Wadlow or Wadlow. Oh, my God. I'm going to have to ask him on the stream how to pronounce his name. How's it spelled? Is it? W-A-D-L-O-W. So we'll oh, I think out. it's Wadlow. I would bet it's Wadlow. Yeah. But I want to talk about some Oscar news. A report was released. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this with you. Um, let me see. There's one that may have graphics that are better. This is from the Women's Media Center. They did an investigation for 2024 into the gender and non-acting Oscar nominations. Here's an infographic. Uh, let me... Make this a little larger so everyone can see it. Okay. Let me get into it. I'm going to scroll down here. Can you see that okay, Alan? Uh, Yeah, but you need to blow that up. Blow it up larger? Yeah. It's like so small in the center of the screen there. Oh, I'm sorry. You're talking about the infographic, right? Yeah, yeah I'm getting to it. Blow okay. Here we go. We're blowing up. All right. Here's the here's the deal. I'll just read this. Women made made modest year-to-year -year gains in the non-acting nominations for the 2024 Academy Awards, with 32% going to women, matching the previous high set in 2021. The increase can large be largely attributed to more women nominees in the major categories of Best Picture, Best Director, Best Screenplay, and Best Editing, and in the below-the-line Crafts categories of Best Makeup, Best Original Score, Production Design, Visual Effects, and Documentary Feature. But despite increases... The number of women recognized with Oscar nominations for these behind the scenes camera roles continues to lag woefully behind that of men, meaning it's never enough. No, <laughs> no matter how many strides are made, it's never enough. Even with an all time high of 32%, more than twice as many nominations, 68% are going to men in the 18 non-acting categories. What are those categories? Let me look at this graphic and I'll, I'll um, read it for you. It's a little tough to read. So these are in the non-acting categories. Women are 30 represent 32%. Um, nominations for best picture women, 29% best director. 20% of the nominees for best director are women. 80% are men. Is it that? 
certain types of people are attracted to certain types of work. This is the thing. I have never in my life, I know this is anecdotal. I know this is anecdotal. I have never seen a woman garbage man. Garbage person. Let me correct myself. Never seen a female garbage person. I have never seen a female plumber. I have never seen evidence. And I'm sure this exists. So this is not a, this is just my personal experience. Why is there not parity among men and women when it comes to oil rigging? Apparently this is a trend now on, on um, TikTok. Have you seen this video trend? It's stupid because the words TikTok preceded that. But the trend is a woman calls her boyfriend or father and says, I got a job at an oil rig. I'm going to be gone for three months. And then you hear the reaction of the man, which is that stupid. You would never survive that. In any case, I just believe. And the thing is, it only goes one way. Like, why aren't there more men, straight men, that work in the hair and makeup department? Is it that certain types of roles attract certain types of people? Maybe. Let's look at this. I'm going to keep going through these statistics. So 20% of the nominees for director are women, 80% men. For cinematography, it's 100% men. For, for film editing, film editing, 40% are women. That's pretty high. In yeah. fact, some of the some of the best editors happen to be women. Um, Thelma Schoonmaker, who works with uh, Martin Scorsese, Marsha Lucas, of course. Jean... And how long? How long have they been editing? Marsha Lucas won an Oscar for editing Star Wars. She saved that movie. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Thelma so, Shoemaker. How, how long has Thelma Shoemaker been editing? Oh, since the seventies. Yeah. Yeah. I it's, mean, I, it's more to like... do with more to do with experience than mm -hmm. than um sex i guess yeah um yeah. nomination and, and, and quality of your work too but let's correct quality of, your quality of work might have something to do with it <laughs> okay uh nominations for writing original screenplay 37 and a half percent are women as opposed to 62 and a half percent men academy mm -hmm. award nominations for writing adapted screenplay only one woman was nominated i love how they do it in percentages and i'm looking at this one woman and five men so 17% women, but they want you to look at the wheel. Like, look at this. It's only 70, 17% yeah. women. Of the it's five women, people. Yeah. It's of like, the six people. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Nominations for documentary feature. 50, 50, six women, six men. And then for documentary short, 40% women, 60% men. There were four women, six men. Um, and uh, here's some here's some more statistics. I don't know how much we want to go through these, how much I want to belabor, but uh, I, I, I'm going to get back to this because there's another thing that I want to share. There's another um, thing that I want to share, which we can do a whole video about this. We can do a whole video about this. Yeah. So I'm going to pivot. I'm going to pivot. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna pivot with a video. I'm gonna pivot with a video here. <laughs> as we go to I I would say something, but you're going to another point and I don't want to break that up. So no, don't. don't. Okay. Well, I mean, let, let me just comment. Wait, 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 well, wait. I like to see Asians in movies. You know, people I mean, I have to constantly be saying that. I hate gay films. No, I hate films with women in it. You're not straight. Hmm. Well, yeah, that was my point. What are you talking <laughs> about? I have no idea. I want to share this website with you. Okay. I'm going to share this website with you. It is a service. It's at cjane.org. Provides a service. And it's called Spell Check for Bias. Aww. What is Spell Check for Bias? Well, let me look at the website. It's actually, we'll put the link in the description of this episode and the clip. Gina Davis is involved with this organization. 
And Plus her, her institute. So of course she has. Right. It's the Gina Davis Institute. I didn't know that existed on Gina Davis Institute on gender in media and in quotes. And it's also, by the way, this phrase is trademarked. If she can see it, she can be it. Uh, it's a website where you can get involved. You can become a member. There's a toolkit. But here's their, here's their role. Spell check for bias. Our innovative script analysis system to infuse diversity and inclusion in entertainment and media where every story must begin on the page. And there are a bunch of, um, there are a bunch of other organizations that support this. Uh, I'm just going to accept their cookies because whatever. Um, but here we go. There's a short video which we we can we can play. But the spell check for bias provides analysis of pre-production scripts with the purpose of identifying opportunities for greater representation of marginalized communities within six major identities: gender, race, LGBTQIA+, identity, disability, age, and body type. This is the so-called you could call this the sweet baby ink for movies as well as identification of biases tropes and stereotypes representation issues harmful language and potential cultural inaccuracies the spell check for oh. bias team uses a text okay this is what they use a text analysis tool to identify mm. character oh. prominence. Oh, you gotta hear this <laughs> to identify character prominence and social science research to inform the in-depth analysis. This is what Dakota Johnson was talking about in that um, thing mm -hmm. that um, Dante put out on Verbal yeah. Riot. So follow him. Um, the script's written by committee, basically. This right. is a script written by a, a, a gender anti-bias AI, so to speak. Yeah. Let me let me let me finish reading this. Then we're going to watch this yeah. short video. It's about a minute and a half. Um, uh, the team also collaborates with the University of Southern California's Signal Analysis and Interpretation Lab. Um, the acronym is SAIL to create a who speaks to whom chart that relies on machine learning to produce the frequency and rate at which major characters are speaking to each other. Central to the ethos of Spellcheck is respecting the artistic integrity of creative work while also increasing knowledge and engaging in informed explorative collaboration or inclusion and equity. Let me just say this. This is everything that Dakota Johnson was talking about. This is AI. This is something that no Quentin Tarantino movie or Kevin Smith movie for that matter would survive this process. This is the machine AI version of the sensitivity read. And here we go. Um, I'll finish up here. What if a, a film's potential for on-screen diversity and equity and inclusion could be identified where every film or television show begins? The script. And then it says to learn more. And then you can go to cjane.org. There's a short video here that um, explains it at the risk of getting a copyright strike. We're going to watch it. Just, just if there's music behind it, just be careful. Right, right. Uh, we're going to look at this and then we're going to talk about it we talk about everything we talked about on the back end with your comments. Um, and I, we're, before we play this video, Alan, what are your thoughts on this? Oh, <laughs> I, you know, good stories used to start with an idea. Uh, you can't start a story that way anymore. You know, you've got to think about the big, the big picture of who your characters are, you know, everything like everything that this represents, it, it does nothing but stifle creativity. Uh, and that's 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 the direction Hollywood is headed down right now. You are one hundred percent correct, Alan. Yeah. And we're gonna watch Play this the video. Damn video. It's uh, eighty <laughs> seconds, a minute and twenty one seconds. Let's play this video. I'm gonna have to mute myself. I will make it full screen. Thank you for your patience. We're kind of we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants today because I got I got no Alan in the background. I got no Alan. So here we go. Uh, all right. I'm going to have to start it and then mute myself here. I'm going to mute myself. All right. Just a second. <laughs> the suspense is killing. When you're 
Okay, hold on. What are you doing? You're describing a crowd scene in the script. You have to write a crowd gathers, comma, which is half female. <laughs> For the past seven years, the Gina Davis Institute has broken ground with this machine learning analysis of bias in film and television. But what if the potential for representation on screen could be identified first on the page? With the GDIQ's spell check for bias, powered by patented AI text analysis technology developed at the University of Southern California, a script can be analyzed for representation of characters and percentage of dialogue by gender, race, LGBTQIA, and disabilities percentage of non-gender identified speaking characters, highlighting opportunities for more balanced representation, and so much more. An intervention tool to infuse diversity and inclusion in entertainment and media, where every story must begin. Oh my God. By the way, if you're sending your kid to USC, uh, there you go. That's where your money's going. Okay, um, <laughs> it's it's exactly what we thought. This is this is the sweet baby gang AI tool for movies, mm -hmm. and no Christopher Nolan movie, Kevin Smith movie, Denis Villeneuve movie, Tarantino, none of them would survive this tool. And this is University of Southern California, a school I actually had interest in attending when mm. I was a kid. All of this can be found at uh, <laughs> cjane.org. Well, let's be fair. It was a good school when you were a kid. Yeah. Well, now I I, I think that almost going to college yeah. at this stage is kind of a, um, it's not the pathway. Yeah. It's not the pathway toward well, getting the thing that you, that, that you're looking, that you're seeking. Well, I'll say this. It's not worth the money you're about to invest in it. Right. Or right. go in debt for. Right. But this is, that's, a, look. <laughs> what is so amazing about art, in particular when it comes to film, are imperfections. This is mm -hmm. trying to make some utopian world where, you know, you, you saw in the beginning of the video where it said, and half the crowd is female. Like, and whatever. You know, these are choices a director makes also. But it's so bizarre that this now must be forced upon screenplays in, in their early stages. I think what this has the danger of doing is gentrifying all art because art can be messy and art can be art can, you know, it's the imperfections that make it so unique because it comes from a human being, right? This is why, for the most part, most movies that we review, they don't get a 10 out of 10. But, you know, God, anything above an eight is pretty spectacular, you know, uh, but, yeah. but, I'll, but, but this is just, I'm just kind of shocked that these, and these tools have been right under our nose this whole time. They've been right under our nose the whole time. Now, who is, who is suggesting that, that people use this and the fact well, that they the, turned it into an say, AI it's, tool it's, in the script stage is not. I was just say who it's this non-binary person in the background here. Well, it's always like a weird person. I notice this in every commercial now is if you are a light skinned brown person, prepare to constantly work in commercials because that's the it's it's like, well, we don't want to go with a white person and we don't want to go with maybe someone who's so darker skinned. So we're going to go this direction, which is the sort of middling ethnically ambiguous person. It's just it's the height of yeah of gentrification it, it's, it's it yeah it, it's like telling an artist a painter to say paint me a beautiful picture but here are the colors you can use and they and then and they go well, why can't i use this other color well people have been using that color so much in the past that you can't use that color anymore so you've got to use these colors and all now what all you're doing now is taking an artist a future artist and say and giving them limitations and saying this is what you can do and this is what you can't do and that that realm of what you can't do is getting larger and larger by the minute this is this is yet another guardrail on creativity mm -hmm. and i think it's 
this is not a positive step. Mm -hmm. This is dystopian. This is Orwellian. And um, this, this is, look, I guess a product of our time, I think it's just bad ideas. And it's not going to result in any sort of great art, but something that's completely gentrified or what something that you would probably watch on mm -hmm. CBS, which was a TV channel back in the day. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's not like you're making the choice to do it. The, the choice is being forced upon you. So if you're right. a creative, if you're a creative, you, you are no long, you, you cannot think 100% independently for yourself. Uh, someone has to come in, some consultant, some government agent has to come in and tell you how you can think and how you can do your art, which is completely the opposite definition of what art is. Uh, it is an expression of a singular person. And, uh, and that was what Dakota Johnson was saying is that, or what the implication I got was the fact that the best stories being told are the ones where there's one author involved, maybe two. Uh, and the worst stories are the ones that are run by a giant committee uh, full of right. just rules rules and regulations as to how you can tell your story and that's why you know why christopher nolan ha has earned that right to be able to tell his story his way and and the studio will back off from it uh and not tell him that he doesn't have enough people of color uh in his in in oppenheimer uh but but the problem is is if you want to get into that system now that you're forced to play by those rules. And so the idea that a Christopher Nolan can come along, a new Christopher Nolan or Quentin Tarantino can come along is, uh, I mean, they're dead. Uh, they're, they're no longer allowed in Hollywood anymore. Right. Right. All right. Let's go to your comments and questions on this as we lead up to our interview of the day. And we're going to stay on top of the story, by the way. Mm -hmm. Here we go. All right. Um, starting with Thomas Pickett says a fun thing is a fun thing to do is to look at the election map. If only men voted. Oh, I've seen that map. I've seen what that map looks like. It's interesting. Um, thank you for that. The captain. Are we law talking about just cis men or are we talking about? Uh, <laughs> Stop going. it. <laughs> uh, the captain's log says long live film thread. Anyways, what have you made of Denise comments on dialogue and his views on more powerful women in Dune? Thank you gentlemen for all. Um, one, I think, um, Denis Villeneuve is a fan of cinema and I agree with him. I think dialogue, especially a lot of mm -hmm. genre films can get too wordy with like this happened, this happened, this, happened. you would see that they call it techno babble in star Trek. Um, I think that he captured the spirit of Dune. And I like Dune part two for the most part. However, I don't like how he changed the women. I think the women were very powerful in particular, Cheney's character, Chani, Cheney, whatever you want to say. Um, mm -hmm. I really don't like now I've seen the film a fourth time and it really stands out. It doesn't work for me. And I think, I think he's also trying to thread the need needle of making the movie he wants to make while placating the powers that be. Yeah. So, I'll, I'll chime in by saying, you know, the tradition of television from, from the very beginning you know, television from the very beginning was basically people in a room talking. Yeah. And uh, you got some really great television out of that. Playhouse 90, uh, Twilight Zone. Uh, I mean, Rod Serling was kind of the master of these these, uh, these dramatic uh, television uh, pr programs. Uh, and because you couldn't go outdoors, you couldn't do action. Um, and so it was so, that dialogue was so important, especially when you needed a show that people would come back to week after week after week. Comedy, sitcoms were all words, were all dialogue. Um, and and that's not something you want to necessarily see when you go into the movies, when you spend $20 a ticket, or back then even $5 a ticket, you don't want to see necessarily people talking. Not that there aren't great movies of people talking, but the majority of it is is just action. And uh, and I'll, I'll tell you this, uh, you know, the, the best Star Trek movies versus the, the least successful Star Trek movies, the least successful ones were the ones that were basically two hour episodes uh, versus the, the big epics like Wrath of Khan or, or the, the Voyage Home or something like that. Well, thank you, Philip Martinez, for becoming a member. Appreciate that. David Garcia says Asian Screenwriter Society. Ah, let me write that down. Ass. <laughs> and then someone says, I don't understand this joke. Benjamin says, this is all the No, a a idiotic. 
Yeah. A idiotic. Yeah. That's, why, that's I, why you have me here. That's why I, I should get dad jokes. I have jokes. to explain jokes to you. You have that's... to explain dad jokes to me? <laughs> I'm sorry. I was just looking like Aldi. What's Aldi? Aldi is a shoe brand, right? Am I wrong? No, it's a... a no, Aldi is a, it's a kind of a, a grocery store, a, a small grocery store. Aldi, that's right. That's yeah. like a super, yeah, I, I, Aldi's. Yeah. More like a convenience store, I think. I think. Right. Hey, Fear the Turtle 21 says, know what's hilarious? Some of the most liberal slash woke women I know, including some from Gen Z, have recently told me they hate this crap. Even they agree things have gone too far. Yep. And Phil Gone says this is literally South Park's death camp of tolerance. <laughs> ah, love it. And Jimmy Francis says, sad, one used to respect Gina Davis back in the day and root for her, ruining her legacy. I loved her in the fly. Thelma Louise wasn't bad. I mean, for its day, I thought Thelma Louise was fun. You know, yeah. it's a little serious. Freaking Brad Pitt, his first big thing. Uh, my third. IJ, it's like writing a song where you have to use all the notes to equal number of times. Oh, wow. that I didn't even think oh, about that. Oh, that's it's funny. like writing a song where you have to use all the notes. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, like you just uh -huh. can't. It's not going to be perfect. Siphon says, BlackRock said recently that ESG isn't working out too well. Money might run out soon. Good. Good. And Patrick Lemire says, hey, Patrick Lemire. I was listening to a podcast today where the head of Netflix, Ted Sarandos, said diversity of thought was more important than diversity. Look for pitchforks uh -oh. now. By the way, I used to know uh, Ted Sarandos. He probably would never remember me back in the day, but he used to buy DVDs from Film Threat. He used to buy um, Film Threat distributed a bunch of indie movies on on standard def DVD, this is in the early 2000s. Netflix would buy 700 copies of every movie we put out, and they were the fastest to pay. He had a lot of integrity, and I appreciated that about. I, him. I will tell you, I think he barely remembered you. Uh, I think you were too drunk when you were telling. Him oh, that. that's right. I did talk to him. <laughs> yeah, this you talked like, to him about the exact same thing. The, the I think I thing. no, I just said what like no, and he was just like yeah, yeah. but he was being mobbed by people. Yeah. I just was like, hey, it was a, yeah. film threat. It was a Netflix party for crying out loud. So, uh, yeah, he yeah, was being his mobbed. Attentions were elsewhere. He's he's pretty based, I think, but he's also like, he's also he's based, but he's also like understands. Like, look, I want everybody to like Netflix. Mm -hmm. You know, there are segments or sort of micro audiences, and that's great. Yeah, I mean, when you and can have Dave Chappelle. Says, when you have Dave Chappelle on one side and Hannah Gatsby on the other, it, it shows that he is employing a uh, diversity of thought. You know, Wait, we don't have to this? always like it. Eric K says, Chris is a wonderful, Chris is a wonderful guy. I do not care what you all say. Wait, who's saying stuff in my own chat. That's very depressing. <laughs> all right. Yeah, hey, chat is going the interview is about to be here, but I, I gotta, I gotta take a quick break. So Alan, you're taking over and you're going to read comments until I get back. Okay, hold on. Why is Oh, we need to start some comments here so I can uh so I can get to it. Or just look at the comments as they're scrolling. Yeah. Oh. I know. All right. Hey, Eric K, uh okay, no, we just read that one. Uh Ted, Mike Mike MC Wong, Ted's Arandos. Hey, Miss Peacock, if you can only grab some chats here, that would be very helpful. Um let's see. Let's see. Indiana Jake says, I have a BlackRock ETF and they recently did a massive S oh, a five to one stock split. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I mean, it sounds good, I guess. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, from Guy Gad Bias. Gad Bois. Gad Bois. Uh, sad fact, Gina Davis has even spoken at the UN under gender in movies. Um, well, yeah, I was going to say that about the whole uh, Oscar story, but you know, I think. Look, uh, I was at a certain, I was at a women's uh, meeting uh, about this subject a while ago, and what, what we're showing is that there, you know, in terms of directors, let's just take directors for a second. There is a balance of men and women directors in television, um, and you're starting to see that 
happen in movies now where uh, you are seeing in terms of numbers wise uh, working directors uh, you know the the ranks of women are going up but the problem with, is when we talk about the Oscars we, we forget the word that comes before directing and that's the word best and the Oscars it, it's not like the Oscars is going out of its way to uh, nominate movies that are you know balanced uh, male female the Oscars for its intended purpose is looking for the best which which throws out the question well why aren't women making the best movies and you know the only thing i could say to that is maybe over time but uh you know let me ask you this why is the marvels not getting any uh directing nominations why isn't marvels getting any of any of that uh you still have to make the best movie uh that's my point there all right um Let's see, Davina Duckworth, uh, Death Camp of Tolerance was aired in 2002. Uh, Stitch yeah, says, God. thank goodness Alan is here to save the stream. That's right. I just did I ruin it? <laughs> I'm saving it. I just needed I know, to- You I must just, have said something. I, I just needed a quick bathroom break. I know. So, so there you go. But um, all right, let's, all we're right. gonna pivot here. Cause this, but I'll just sort of final thoughts on all of this is that I didn't, I, I think a lot of this is we are discovering that this is, um, this is much more prominent than we initially realized. And mm -hmm. all of this has been right in plain sight for years. Mm -hmm. And my concern as someone who's a lifelong fan of cinema, it's my First love is movies. I also love to read books, but I'm, I'm a cinema guy first. And the fact that these types of rules would be imposed upon film now is it's offensive to me. Well, you know and, what it is. So what's what it, I mean, a couple months ago, maybe a year ago, if we were talking like this and saying that there were rules and there were this and there were that we would be labeled conspiracy theorists. Uh, yes. What's happening now? What's happening now is it's being exposed that that it is there and that it does exist, and uh, you know, and, and this is kind of the theme of the next defiles is the fact that uh, what we thought was always there was really there, and uh, and now it's all out in the open. See, that's the difference. It was always there. We never saw it, and we were accused of being conspiracy theorists when we mentioned it. Well, I don't think and we were, were accused. It's just. We we've discovered that holy this stuff is really prominent. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean that was the thing we, we talked yesterday about Az's rant, um, because you know the the thing that the criticism of his of him of that was that uh, he was just you know this is just one instance of it you know so can't you just handle this one time when when he was really saying no this is not one time this is in everything everything he sees everything he plays there's some element of this. And now with Sweet Baby Ink, we realized that he was right, that it was always there, that there was always an element of there, and that there was an organization uh, paid to put it there. Right. And I just want to shout out to the more than 900 people on Rumble watching us live. Thank you so much. Uh, Hit that subscribe we appreciate or you. follow. Hit that yeah. follow. Yeah. We, and, we really uh, need it on Rumble. Real quick, our uh, l l l promo to everyone, and we will be on Rumble Live also. Real quick, a promo for our Oscars watch party that is this Sunday, 3 p.m. Pacific time, 6 p.m. Eastern. Check your local listings. We'll be live on YouTube watching the Oscars with you. Here's your little reminder. That was, that was a little offensive to me. I'm not sure how I feel about that. By the way, when DEI comes after farts, you know it's over. What are you talking about? All right, hey, folks. A film called Imaginary is opening this weekend in theaters all across America. It's from uh, one of my favorite studios making horror films today. And that is Blumhouse from the mind of Jason Blum and... Hopefully I don't mispronounce his name when he joins us. Jeff Wadlow, 
is going to be joining us tonight. I don't know if I said it right. Let's get Jeff on the show to talk about imaginary opening theaters this weekend. <laughs> Hey Jeff! <laughs> oh my God! Did I pronounce your name correctly? I feel bad. Uh, it's actually pronounced Spielberg. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, you nailed it. Perfect. Watch. Oh, good. Good. Hey, uh, congratulations on the film. This is uh, terrifying, and it's based. <laughs> I think it's. I think this is. Look, it's based on the premise that, and I think every kid goes through this. You have an imaginary friend. Every kid has an imaginary friend. You're playing alone in your room or whatever, or you're out there. Every kid has the experience of having an imaginary friend. This takes this concept very far and creates a whole new world. I mean, tell us where imagine imaginary came from and how did you toe the line? I mean, it's PG 13, right? Correct. But it dances right up to that <laughs> R rated line. Tell us, tell us about, uh, Tell us about it. Well, the movie is about an imaginary friend named Chauncey. And actually, the uh, the hero version is uh, right there. See him? Oh, nice. Oh, nice. nice. Oh. That's, that's that. the one. That's the most expensive teddy bear ever made. Um, so the, the movie, yeah, it's about, well, look, it's not just about an imaginary friend. It's not called Chauncey, right? It's not just purely a haunted toy movie like Annabelle or Chucky. The movie's called Imaginary because it's actually about imagination and creativity and the power of that. And honestly, just how scary that can be, right? So that's why we were able to make a really intense, really scary movie that is PG-13 because so much of it is about imagination. So we're not, this isn't, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre isn't about someone killing people with a chainsaw. This is about the terror that can result from your own imagination. And that inherently implies that all, a lot of the tension, a lot of the scares are going to come from things outside the frame. So the same way Spielberg used water and Jaws, we use the power of imagination to imply that things are there that might not necessarily be there. And and when you were, first of all, I just, I think Blumhouse, I will see any Blumhouse movie. I don't care. I just think they're so <laughs> creative when it comes to the choices of films to make, the types of movies. Um, Blumhouse is just... Um, really knocking it out of the park. And uh, while other studios maybe not doing so well, Blumhouse seems to just have their, their finger on the pulse. Did you work with Jason Blum on this and putting it, the project together? And I don't want to get into spoiler stuff. I do want to talk about effects and gore later, but t tell us what it was like to work with Jason. So this is my third movie working with Blumhouse. I have a first look deal with them. Uh, I have an outstanding relationship with Jason. He is I think arguably the most significant producer working in Hollywood right now, because he's actually changing Hollywood. I think in a hundred years, film students will study his career the same way I studied the career of David O. Selznick and Irving Thalberg, right? He is a seminal figure in the field of film producer. Uh, and for that reason, I'm, I feel fortunate to be working with him. Uh, now, how did you also thread the needle of, I think if if I was if, if I was going to take my kid to a horror movie they were of a certain age maybe 11 12 this movie is perfect it's because it just dances right up to the line but doesn't go too far necessarily but I feel like you could have easily done an R rated version of this you know yes and no I mean it wasn't it's not like I did multiple rounds with the MPA to get the PG-13. Really, story drives rating way more than people think. Uh, if you're making a movie about a slasher, like it's going to be hard to get a PG-13. And you're going to have to really cut your shots and, and, and get away from things quickly and, and play that game with the ratings board. When you're making a movie about an imaginary friend, it's, it's really not that hard to get a PG-13 because so much of the danger, so much of the evil, so many of the scares are implied. Um, it's just inherent to the narrative that we're creating. Well, it's like they say, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what I've heard from horror filmmakers, there are like two types of scares. There's the jump scare, and then there's the wind up where the audience knows something is about to happen, but the characters are completely unaware of those events. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, that's dramatic irony, technically, you know, Hitchcock talked a lot about that with the bomb under the table idea that's sort of a right. cliche. And so I think all jump scares are only as good as their wind up. So you, right. you, you have to build the sequence 
to get that big payoff, which is the jump scare. Um, ultimately, I just think it's a mistake to focus on ratings when you're talking about horror because the MPA is not rating how scary a movie is. That's not even a part of their conversation. They're, mm -hmm. they're rating the intensity of the images as far as adult ideas and themes go. So that's drugs, that's sex, that's blood and guts. And you don't need any of those things to make a scary movie, right? Again, it's just, what's the story? If it's about uh, a serial killer, yeah, there's going to be blood and guts in the movie. It's going to be very difficult to get that PG-13. If you're making a movie about an angry, imaginary friend that's going to do terrible things to you, some of them might be real, some of them might not, then it's it's just not that hard to get the PG-13. And I have to compliment you, the trailer for this movie really holds back. Because there are twists and there are things. I feel like if you've seen the trailer, you haven't seen anything. Yeah. Because there are so because the problem <laughs> with so many movie trailers today, they ruin the third act of the movie. You don't even go past the first half of the film, if I'm correct. Yeah. Did you have an sure. insight into that with the trailer? I mean, I love marketing materials. I think it's a part of the process because for me. I don't just make a movie. I'm making an experience an audience has when they go to a theater and they see a movie. And so part of that is, you know, how the movie is presented to them and what are the marketing materials? What is the promise that the movie is making uh, to get you to buy a ticket? And for me as a storyteller, that's a huge part of the storytelling. That's basically the tease. That's, that's the storyteller saying, hey, come sit down around this campfire with me. I'm going to tell you a story about this. So I'm very involved in that. And fortunately, our partners at Lionsgate, I think, are some of the best in the business when it comes to mm -hmm. marketing campaigns. Adam Fogelson, who's the new chairman of the studio, this is the first film he greenlit as chairman of the studio. He comes out of marketing. I mean, he ran Universal Studios. He ran STX. And, and he didn't come up through production. He came up through marketing. So he really understands how marketing is a part of the storytelling. We've got over a 1,000 people watching us live now on YouTube and Rumble. <laughs> and we have a lot of questions. I hope you can stick around and answer some of these questions. Absolutely. Uh, let's go to them right now. Uh, Solomon Thornton asks, greetings, Sir Jeff. <laughs> I saw I saw the trailer and I can't wait. Do you have any advice for beginning filmmakers? Well, you know, I actually teach a short film workshop in my hometown of Charlottesville, Virginia. I've been doing it for 20 years now, which is hard to believe, called the uh -huh. Adrenaline Film Project. And I work with 12 groups of filmmakers to help them basically make a short film in a, in a version of the studio system with Hollywood mentors where they have to pitch and then get a green light. Then they have to write in a day and get a green light. Then they got to shoot in a day. I visit the sets. I give notes. I help them direct some scenes. And then we edit together for a day. I have to green light their, their cut. And then we screen the movie on a Saturday night, 72 hours later and have a big party. And one of the things I talk about in that workshop and it's, and it applies to any beginning filmmaker, as I say, Look, just get it done. If it's good, it's gravy. I think mm -hmm. so often perfection, uh, perfectionism turns into procrastination. There's some cliche, I'm sure I'm butchering it, but people just want it to be perfect. And then because they want it to be perfect so badly, they don't actually just finish. It's just, just get it done. Just make, just finish something, show it to the world. And then you're a filmmaker and you're on your way. Uh, from Aaron Taylor says, question for Mr. Wadlow. What was it like to work with John Bon Jovi in your first major feature <laughs> film, Cry Wolf? It was amazing. I mean, the guy is a prince. You know, we have the same birthday, believe it or not, March 2nd. <laughs> and still 20 years later, you know, I'll email him on our birthday and I say, happy birthday, JBJ. And he writes back immediately and he and wishes me a birth, uh, happy birthday as well. Uh, he's a lovely guy. He's a talented actor. I mean, everything he touches turns to gold. I was really lucky to have him in my first film. Uh, Christopher Moonlight Production says, my daughter and I love going to horror movies together. And I noticed that Blumhouse really has their finger on the pulse with young people. What yeah. is the thought process behind making horror for them? Honestly, they really have their, their finger on the pulse of not just young people, but young female moviegoers. You know, they're really the demographic that drives these scary movies. They're, that's the reason why Truth or Dare was a hit for me. They're, that's the reason why Megan was a big hit for Jason. And so, um, you know, when they're doing their research about marketing materials and when they're thinking about what kind of stories they want to tell, you know, they're thinking about that audience. It's, it's not an accident that the three leads in my movie are not men. Right, right. But I mean, uh, horror has such a rich history of female leads, everything back to Psycho or, you know, 
the first Halloween with Jamie Lee Curtis. It just it just Phantom does. of the Opera. Long ago. Phantom of the, I mean, just like mm-hmm. it, it just does. Sorry, we'll get to that question. But like, I, so I almost feel like while certain genres like romantic comedies more appeal to women, horror is pretty um, it's it's pretty 50 50 male and female. I got to be honest with you, the, the, I would have thought that, too. But the research doesn't bear out. I mean, women really women, women really drive horror movie ticket sales way more than you think. Well, do you ever go to Monster Palooza or Son of Monster Palooza in, in Los Angeles? I'm, I'm familiar with them, but I, I haven't been fortunate enough yet, yet to go. It's that horror convention. It's just, it's pretty 50 50 in terms of a con. And it's, amazing. yeah, I think, I think a con crowd is a little different than, you know, the people who buy tickets, the casual movie goer. I think it's right. just, you, you know, couples often drive movie sales. And when couples are going to the theater, we all know that, you know, right. I, our girlfriend, our wife is going to, you know, have an opinion about what they want to see and they drive those scary movie ticket sales way more than you think. Yeah. Uh, here we go. Another question from Aaron Taylor says, uh, what was your experience with kick-ass too? What is your opinion on Jim Carrey's apparent change of heart over the film during marketing? Okay. I don't know about this. Yeah. So, um, you know, ultimately he decided not to support the film when it, when it came out because he was having a real, uh, I mean, you can read his remarks online. He, he was having some different feelings about violence and the depiction of violence in media after the Sandy Hook shooting, uh, which happened quite a bit before our movie came out. But I, I think it just for him, it was a real moment in time. Um, and look, everyone's entitled to their opinion. I mean, I, I share his views about um, uh, gun violence, but our movie was a satire. It, w- it wasn't really, in my opinion, contributing in, a, in any kind of meaningful way to that conversation, but he felt it was an opportunity for him to get his views out there, and I, I applaud it. Uh, working with him was was amazing. I mean, the guy's a genius. You know, one of the things we love about Jim Carrey is that uh, we never know what he's going to do or say on screen, and I'm here to tell you in real life, you never know what he's going to do. <laughs> like that. Oh, that's great to hear. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, Thanks. Fear the Turtle 21 says, thanks for being here, Jeff. Just curious what movies made you realize you wanted to make horror films. Also, this movie looks awesome. I'll definitely be checking it out. Uh, Thank you, Fear the Turtle. That is very kind of you. Um, I I appreciate the question. Uh, The kind of horror movies um, that made me want to direct horror films. I mean, Poltergeist was a major influence for me with this film. I saw it when I was six in theaters. It really messed me up. I don't know if it made me want to make horror movies so much as it... uh, (laughs) altered my personality forever. Uh, but the horror movies that really has inspired me to work in this genre were the classics. I mean, I, I remember seeing Seven in theaters and really being inspired by that film. Uh, Jaws, obviously, is one of the greatest films of all time. I, you know, it's usually in my top three favorite films of all time. Um, I also really like, you know, subgenres of horror. Horror fantasy, I think, is a very... Um, Underserviced subgenre right now. Like I love everything from Labyrinth to Hellraiser, and you don't see a lot of movies in that space. And and I think Imaginary, when people see it, they'll realize that it really is more of a horror fantasy with with, with big psychological horror elements. But it's it's really a horror fantasy at the end of the day. Red French Moon, who's a member, says, "My question: Does a director need to have a certain atmosphere on set for doing horror movies, or you're leaving that to the actors to get in the mood?" It's an interesting question. You know, DeWanda and I had a bunch of laughs on this movie because we really kind of came to the conclusion that while we were making a very scary movie, uh, the actual process of making a scary movie is kind of hilarious. You know, guys <laughs> in pursuits, eating craft service. I mean, it's just all kind of surreal and, and funny if you just take a step back. Um, but that's sort of my flip answer. My, my serious film school answer is, yeah, absolutely. It's up to the director to create a feeling on set. And, you know, if I'm directing a funny scene, I try to be kind of loud and funny. But if it's a if it's a serious scene where the actor needs to be having a real emotional moment and responding in fear to something, I make sure that set is quiet. I make sure the crew respects what's going on. And I do everything I can to support that actor in, in that performance beat. Hey, I have a question, me. but uh, sorry. Oh, I, yeah, sorry, just a question. But what, what did you guys think when uh, when you heard that I am was going to come out in a, a few months after this? You mean I F? I F. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, we were editing the movie in New York in the same building 
on the same floor that they were editing their movie. So I actually passed John Krasinski in the hallway a few times. And I mean, obviously I know who he is. He has no idea who I am. So I kind of like kept my head down. I don't know. There's a long history in Hollywood actually of movies about the same thing coming out at the same time, like White House Down and Olympus Has Fallen or Volcano and Dante's Peak. I mean, it's it's actually kind of an interesting um, thing that happens sometimes in the film industry. Fortunately, our films are so different in tone. I mean, they've made this wonderful, based on the marketing materials, they, it looks like they've made this wonderful live action Pixar feeling family film uh, that looks very funny and emotional. I'm a huge Ryan Reynolds fan. Whereas our movie is a low budget Blumhouse supernatural horror movie. So they, they couldn't be more different in tone. So I think there's plenty of space in the, in the marketplace for both. Well, there, there are heartfelt family moments in your movie as well. Plenty there are a few. I mean, <laughs> a lot. We have, we have characters that hopefully people will care about. But I, I don't. I, I think it would be the <laughs> definition of false advertising to call our family film. Yeah, you're not taking the kids. This, right? <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, Mr. Wadlow. I think The Strain is an underrated show. Were you more involved than just the writing? I mean, honestly, not much more involved. So what happened with that show is, I believe it was their fourth season was their final season, and I don't. I don't. I love writing. Sometimes I write and I don't direct. Sometimes I direct things I haven't written. I, you know, I wear a lot of different hats and I love TV and film. And uh, Carlton Cuse, who's a showrunner on Lost, has, is a mentor of mine. I helped with the first season of Bates Motel. It's really just Carlton, me and Carrie Aaron who figured out the first three episodes. And then uh, I just finished a, a comedy for Netflix and Carlton reached out to my reps and asked if I would come in and work on the final season of The Strain as a, as a writer producer. And I said, um, you know, I don't really staff Carlton. It's not kind of not really my thing. I, I did Bates because it was interesting to me to start a show with you and, and, and launch a show. And that was an incredible learning experience for me. And he said, uh, he has this very deep uh, voice. It's very specific. You know it when you hear it. He said, uh, well, Jeff, I taught you how to launch a show. Wouldn't you like to know how to end a show? And I was like, okay, that's that's exciting. <laughs> so I, I was on staff and it was an incredible group of writers and I had a lot of fun. And when you're the writer, director, of, and producer of a movie like I am for Imaginary, it's all on your shoulders, right? You got to make it happen every day. And if there's a false moment in that movie or if you go over budget on that film, it's 100% on you. When you're in a room full of writers and and you've been hired to just kind of come in and help out with the final season. It's, it's, I find it kind of liberating because I could just pitch crazy ideas. And if Carlton liked them, they were in the show. If Carlton said no, they weren't in the show. And, and I just didn't lose a minute of sleep. And so it was wonderful. Uh, from Rumble, Caveat Ties says, how do you go about acquiring a, a team of crew members such as set builders and such? And I'll say this, the set in, in parts of the movie is kind of a character. Yeah. In the film. So it's very important. Uh, yeah, it's critical. I mean, every movie is basically a little startup business. So you have to hire all these people and it's all about your partners and setting up a pyramid. So the, the kind of the director and the line producer sit at the top of that pyramid. Yeah. You have executives and, and other producers who aren't on set, but when you're really talking about the production itself, boots on the ground people, it's, you know, a, you know, a creative producer, a director and a line producer. And line producer means that's the person who kind of holds the line between the budget. I mean, sorry, the talent, which is above the line and everything else, which is below the line. That's the crew, the catering, the sound stages, the props, all those line items in the budget are called below the line items. Um, and you just start prepping and you start hiring people. And, and a movie is very almost military in its organization. So you, you start hiring other people like one level down on the pyramid. And then they hire the people below them who bring in the teams below them. And it's all about relationships, honestly, and, and, and good word of mouth from other productions. Just a few more questions here. Some really insightful stuff because some a lot of people in our audience are aspiring filmmakers. L.A. Scribe says, Jeff, do you cut the gratuitous blood, nudity, and sex to achieve a PG-13 and follow up like me? Uh, do you leave in like 12 frames of R-rated material in the edit bay <laughs> to subliminally get it by the censors, so to speak? You know, on this movie, I honestly, I didn't really cut anything out. Like everything I shot is in the movie. We didn't have to jump through any hoops to get the PG-13 rating. 
on more on movies that have stories which lend themselves to R ratings, where I've gotten the PG-13 rating, like Truth or Dare or Cry Wolf or even my action movie Never Back Down. Uh, yeah, it's a negotiation. You go back and forth. They, they don't have any written rules. There's no guidelines. You kind of learn from experience. You have a lot of conversations about it with the MPA, but it's really just a group of parents that are watching the movie and kind of telling you what they think. It's not like there's some censor or some bureaucrat that's making the decision. It's a, it's a voluntary organization that parents participate in and they, they give you the rating. Um, and yeah, it, it can be a lot of back and forth and it can be a negotiation, but ultimately they're just trying to, you know, provide a service that ultimately promotes movie going. So I don't really rail against them. They're not trying to stop me from making my movie. They're, they're trying to get information out there uh, so that when an audience shows up for their, for your movie, they understand what they're going to watch and they're not disappointed or angry or, or feel like they've been misled. And uh, last question here from Susanu Ala Richard says, uh, curious about your thoughts of the, for the, of the use of humor in horror films to affect the audience's mood. Yeah, all my all my movies have humor in them. I, I can't make a movie without levity. It's, um, you know, I work in a lot of different genres. I don't just work in the horror space. I also have made action movies and comedies. And I'm really trying to emulate the career of a filmmaker like Richard Donner, who made Superman and Lethal Weapon. And, and you know, he also made The Omen. I mean, he worked in all these different genres, Goonies. Um, and, and I want to do the same thing because for me, genre is like not dissimilar to, I imagine, how a chef views cuisine. So if you're a chef, you don't want to only make French food your entire career. You probably would love to work at an Italian restaurant or, or try mm -hmm. a, a different kind of ethnic cuisine. And, and what you do is you, you, you identify the pillars that, that people expect in that genre. And then you try to offer your spin. And my spin always includes humor. Like I can't do something that's just like a dirge. It's just not my style. I, I like those movies. I don't have a problem with them personally, but I just find humor in, in everyday life no matter how grim the circumstances might be. I think the trick is you just never sell out the stakes. You don't want to make a parody. You're not making a skit. It needs to feel real for the characters, but there's no reason why the characters can't find humor in their in certain moments. Well, Jeff, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Congratulations on Imaginary opens this weekend in theaters tomorrow, actually, Thursday. Yes. Well, thank you for having me. I love yeah. talking to fellow film nerds about film. It's a great thing <laughs> that you guys do. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. All right. Take care. Thank Thanks again. Care, See you well. soon. Later. What a great guy. That was yeah. awesome. That was awesome. I love um, talking shop. Yeah. Well, I mean, our audience is very engaged when it comes to all of our interviews mm. here. So let's get yeah. some. We had some final <laughs> super chats and questions that came. I can figure we should we should reference the Truth or Dare podcast uh, that Film Thread did many years ago. <laughs> what? Remember the Truth oh! or Dare? <laughs> who, 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 why? Why? How, how did that come? He up? directed it because he directed that, and he mentioned. Oh it my god, that. I hated that movie. <laughs> it, it didn't have to do with him. It was the script. Yeah, I know. It was the script. Oh my god, that's hilarious. But yeah, no, I hated that film. It was a terrible script. Um, imaginary is much better than that. We're going to talk about imaginary on Friday. Uh, we will get to a review of that, but we have some final comments, questions here as we wrap up. Let's start with a very generous super chat from Skiz Spivak Esquire for 20 it says hail film thread. You gents and the film threat crew are very much appreciated. Just saying still searching for a dune popcorn bucket in the land of X-ray girl. Uh, they're only at they're only at AMC theaters. You're talking about Canada. Uh, oh, Canada. Only, okay. So if I can get a couple extra buckets, I'll bring them to Vegas to give to X-ray girl. But they're sold out. I, I don't know anyone that can get one now. Like they're gone. Okay. They're yeah, gone. I'm, yeah, I had to buy mine in La Jolla. Like, right, right. They're gonna sell out. But what I'm saying is at AMC theaters, they're gone. Because the SNL thing happened and it's, they just sell out. So I don't know. I'll do my best to get one, but uh, maybe a problem. Um, yeah, it is what it is, but yeah. Um, it's Canada. I mean, if there's AMC theaters in Canada search, otherwise you're going to pay 80, a hundred bucks on um, eBay. Sorry, man. 
But thank you, Skiz. That was very generous. Um, and Skiz also became a YouTube member. Hmm, thank you wow. for that. And uh, look, Susano Alla Richard sends in, sends in 111. Love it. Thank you. That's generous. We She asked a very good question. And Vorpol Snack, even their non-binary definition proves their claims of 175 different genders wrong. That's uh, referencing the what we talked about earlier. And Siphon says DEI just can't be profitable because every project is bombing, but it's been going on for years now. Yeah, I think there needs to be a come to, well, maybe a come to Jesus moment about this, um, that it's not, it's not resonating with audiences. I mean, I think it's very, I think the box office is very democratic. If you want to see a movie, you will pay to see it. And I think a lot of people paid with their wallets uh, this past weekend. And, um, you know, well, I mean, that begs, the, that begs the question, can DEI ever create a good movie? No, I don't think they can. And Vorpal Snack asks, Chris, is that six Dune popcorn buckets behind yeah. you? Let me count. There's one, two, uh, three, three yeah. and then four, five. And then these, and then I got the drink cup holders. One is, uh, this is House Atreides right here. And this is House Harkonnen. So the yeah. little Dune. Thing. Look, yeah. let me just say <laughs> this as a Dune fan. There's not a lot of Dune merch. Dune merch is few and far between, doesn't exist. Dune kind of, although I'm super excited about the Dune Awakening video game coming out for PS5. I will live stream that. I will live stream that. I have no idea when it's coming out, though. But, no. okay. That about wraps well, you'll, up. You'll be down one Dune bucket soon, so. Uh, hopefully. Why, do you really? Wait, so. wait, what's going on? Alan, what happened to you? Oh, I don't know. Well, I'm taking mine back, so. Uh, All right. Yeah. Hey, so, yeah, okay. All right, folks. That about wraps it up for us today. Here's what's coming up. Friday on the show, we're going to have a bunch of movie reviews. That's right. We're going to be talking to the director of the Omicron Killer. We're going to get a preview from Alan of films playing at mm -hmm. South by Southwest. Some of the movies he's already seen. We're going to talk about Imaginary, Problemista, and uh, oh, Cabrini. What else? Cabrini. Uh, Danzel, Kung Ricky Fu Stanwyck. Panda There's a lot. I don't know if we're going to get Kung to Kung Fu movies. Panda 4. Oh, my God. For real? Yeah, I, I'm trying to see Snack Shack tonight, but I don't know if that's going to happen. It's going to be a jam-packed, review-heavy, uh, and I'm seeing a movie tonight called Robot Dreams. I don't know if we'll get to that, but that's a movie. I'm putting it in our list. We have, like, this little planning sheet. Yeah. We about yeah. Movies. And by the way, Friday before the stream, uh, an hour before the stream, I'm doing the Fallout experience at South By. So uh, uh, it should I should be back in time. Are you sure you're going to have time? I will. I'll, I'll check the. Uh, I'll check it out. Make sure I can actually pull it out there. Is that you? Sorry. No. Yes, that was me. Sorry. Okay. All right. That was oh, me. You're watching, you're watching porn. I wasn't watching. I was trying to get a screenshot of <laughs> okay. you and I. So, right. cool. And Siphon became a new YouTube member. And I want to say thank you to our mods, Lord Thoth, Gridiron Masters. Everyone else in the chat there. A thank you also to Ms. P. Coffee and Glenn Brown, our producer. There you go. Okay. We will see you Friday, everyone. Alan, you are in Austin, Texas now. Where yes. is the meetup going to be? Where is the meetup going to be? That's a good question. Oh, uh, I'm going, I'll be at the uh, Almo Draft House tomorrow uh, at, at Slaughter, Slaughter, Austin, the Slaughter area of Austin. I don't know what it is, but. Uh, I'll be there at the uh, 3.30 screening of Kung Fu Panda. And you can see that screening and, and we can hang out afterwards. Okay, so Alan is going to see it. The Alamo Draft. Will you put it out on social media so people yeah. know? Yeah. So follow Alan at my pal Al on Twitter. We're film threat on everything. I know it's sort of annoyingly in your face with this VHS tape, but we got to have some kind of background. And there you go. I'm excited. It's going to be wild. Friday is just going to be all movie reviews. And then the watch party. I cannot <laughs> wait for our watch party. And we're still doing yes. a versus on Monday. <laughs> yeah, we're still doing verses. Oh. Well, you're Ooh. not going to be there. You don't need to be there. Okay. So yeah, you I'm can watch the movies. Yeah. You got stuff to do, but we will be doing our Oscar hangover versus show. 
It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and Alan is strategically, I feel like, how's the chair? How's the chair? It's, uh, this one's metal. I'm like, the, no, no, the last one was metal too. So I'm not safe. Okay. I just want to make sure that the chair is okay because yeah. you know that we've had some issues. Yeah. I'm just saying uh, Texas doesn't make good chairs. That's all I'm saying. All right. Well, there you go. All right. <laughs> Let's go, Alan. Let's get out of here.